Good morning, no, good day everybody. So we will continue the discussion of, of the wave equation. We already know a lot about wave equations in two space-time directions, uh, dimensions, which means one space dimension, but let us switch slowly to the more realistic case, namely three space dimensions, which is four space-time dimensions. And I mentioned um, that the equation is takes this form and this operator according to Einstein, I, I use this um, symbol and this is Laplace operator which in uh, Cartesian coordinates is just a sum of second derivative with respect to Cartesian coordinates this is time or maybe tau because whenever it is important I make distinction between t and tau tau in principle is the time but measured in the same uh, units like the distance okay but maybe let it be t okay <laughs> because it doesn't matter sometime it is, I will uh, discriminate between those two okay so <laughs> I man so uh, the Laplace operator whereas this operator it is wave operator or uh, we in Poland we used to be strongly related with French culture therefore we call it like the Frenchmen do uh, D'Alembert, the operator, or simply wave, uh, wave operator. And I began my uh, the discussion with the discussion of Laplace operator in curvilinear coordinates. This will be very important for us in the sequel, as you will see. So I claimed that in any that I, uh, uh, there is a nice formula which um, is valid in any curvilinear coordinate because in Cartesian coordinates, as I told you, it is a simple. Yeah, in Cartesian coordinates, it is simply second derivative with respect to x plus second derivative with respect to y plus etc. Very easy. This may also be generated to higher dimensions. You see, you probably know that those crazy people who are doing very high energy physics, they consider sometimes uh, 11 dimensional space time, sometimes even 27 dimensions, and so on. And it may be continued like that. I will not go beyond <laughs> four uh, space time dimensions. But I will need the formula, which is valid not only in Cartesian co coordinate by, but in any set co of coordinates. And I have written that, so this is in Cartesian, in any curvilinear system of coordinates, the formula is the following, I will write it down, and then I will discuss it. Okay, so it is 1 over square root of g, where g is sorry, G stands for the determinant of the 
metric tensor, and I will discuss that, 1 over square root of that, and now uh, derivative with, or maybe I will use k and l, which are better visible, k, of the following. Again, square root of g, but now in enumerator and not in denominator. Now, the inverse uh, metric tensor, and again, k, the derivative number l, and that's all. This is just a um, written in an operator form. Yeah? If, if you ask me how does it act, acts because this is an operator which acts on functions. Yeah? So if I want to know how does it acts on a function f, I put a function f, which means that I, I first consider first derivative of this f with respect to uh, the coordinate number l. Then I take a sum over L with this matrix, then I multiply it by, by this square root of G, and again I take the second derivative, because after all we know that it is second order differential operator, and I take a sum over case, and the result I divide. Theorem. This does not uh, depend upon the choice of coordinates, which simply means that if you choose any system of coordinates, if you pass from one to the, uh, to the other, the value of this function at a single point x remains the same. So this is really a universal formula. You may call it even a magic formula because it is so. If you, usually students of uh, first year of undergraduate students are supposed to memorize this, not this formula, but special cases, how the uh, uh, Laplacian looks in, for example, uh, spherical coordinates and how in elliptic coordinates and so on and so on. But all these cases are included within this formula. This formula is very, very simple formula from differential geometry, but today it is not a talk in differential geometry, so I will remain on the level of, of uh, uh, advertisement of differential geometry. Differential geometry is a very beautiful branch of mathematics. Okay. Now, what is this uh, tensor product? Tensor product. I have mentioned in one of the, of the previous talks that Euclidean geometry is nothing but the uh, set equipped with the structure of uh, of vectors, yeah, and those vectors have this this structure of uh, of uh, scalar product, yeah. So, but this space of vectors, it is a vector space, which means that you may always choose a basis. Let me call the basis E. K E L. So this G K L K L is nothing but just a table of all possible tensor products between the 
elements of the basis. And because every vector may be spanned with respect to the basis, it means that if we know this finite collection, which we may organize into a, a matrix, then we know everything. Because whenever we put uh, some other vector, it is just a combination of those, and this combination coefficients we put outside, and everything is known. So knowing this vector, uh, uh, sorry, scalar product is exactly equivalent to knowing this table, which we call uh, tens, uh, me, uh, uh, mm, ma, no, matter, matter, uh, metric tensor, yeah, oh, it's good, which is simply called met, matter tensor which simply means, means that the entire knowledge about this complicated, not so complicated, but an abstract structure is contained in knowing this n square, where n is the dimensionality, n square function. So this is one story, but probably you have studied this, but, but I want to present my point. And now, but this was in uh, flat space, Euclidean space. Euclidean space is very specific because you may identify vectors which are attached to each point. But those of you who are doing general relativity or similar uh, fields, you are dealing with uh, curved spaces. And in curved space, it is a nonsense to uh, compare uh, vectors which are attached at different points. For example, take a, a surface of, of the Earth. Here, we, ha we have a tendency to think that we have vectors which are tangent to the Earth, yeah? And in New York, they have different vectors. And a priori, there is no relation between these vectors and, th and those vectors. So, in a flat space, if I ask you what is a vector in a flat space, ah, the answer is very simple. It is just a... A pair of points. But in a curved space, this answer is a nonsense. If you have two points, for example, uh, Warsaw and New York, what is the vector? There is no vector which uh, somehow connects them, yeah? So we need, in differential geometry, people were looking for a good local definition of, of a vector which is tangent to something which is curved. And during 19th century, there were, in fact, differential, the, the real dif differential geometry began with Riemann, which he, means around 1860 or something like that. But then there were different... When I was young, I was uh, still reading old books, and it, the definition of a vector was very lousy, very bad. But around the mid of... 20th century, people have discovered that the best definition of a local vector is that a vector is a first order differential operator. Because if you have a vector and a function, then you know what does it mean to differentiate a, a, a function with respect, but only at, at this point. 
This is nothing but d over dxkf. Therefore, the very nice and very useful for computational reasons, very useful definition of a local vector is just a first order differential operator. Of course, what does it mean? It, there is some nice geometric uh, definition and there is a theorem that whenever you choose a, a local coordinates, then any first order differential operator is just a superposition of those. Therefore, there is always a, a basis. Whenever you choose a coordinate system xk, you immediately have chosen a basis in, a, in a, the set of those uh, tangent vectors, which simply means that now we may forget about the flatness because if we are thinking about vectors as pairs of points, this applies exclusively to flat spaces. But if we abandon this uh, ideology and think that on an earth, for instance, at each point there is a space of those vectors. In this point, there are those vectors. And the best definition of a vector is that it is a first order differential equation and there is a rigorous mathematical theorem that every first order differential operator is a superposition of those uh, basic differential operators which we have at hand whenever we choose. Therefore, whenever you choose a system of coordinates, then this tensor product is nothing but the uh, table of uh, scalar products between them. This is the... Yeah, okay, now, determinant, you know what is determinant. This is an inverse matrix, and that's all. As far as the definitions are concerned, now let, let us make a very short exercise. Because I, I will need the expression of, uh, of a Laplacian in spherical coordinates. What are spherical coordinates? Everybody knows, but the fundamental thing is to know how to pass from spherical to uh, Cartesian. Yeah? Okay. So, um, it is R sine theta cosine phi. This is R sine theta sine phi. And this is R cosine theta, so this r theta phi are spherical coordinates, these are Cartesian coordinates, and r is obvious, r is the distance from the center. What is theta? I have a tendency because I, I have sailed a lot, so I have a tendency to think about ge geographical coordinates, so I have a tendency to think ab about uh, lat uh, longi geographical longitude, longitude, yeah? 
However, the, the, the navigators uh, start counting uh, the longitude from equator. Equator is zero, positive on the north, the hemisphere negative here. But mathematicians prefer, and it is uh, better in, in um, you are probably used to. They start at North Pole, where it's zero. Now, 90 degrees, which means pi, is at equator. No, uh, half of pi is at the equator, and pi is on South Pole. Yeah? Okay. And I will use this mathematical and not geographical convention, whereas phi is nothing but the longitude. Whether you start from, from uh, Greenwich or from Paris, because in uh, 18th century, most people were uh, start, uh, the uh, zero uh, was at Paris because in 18th century the physics and mathematics was more French than British, but then French uh, there was a French Revolution and many. French scientists were simply killed, and in 19th century it was more British than French. So the zero was switched to Greenwich. Okay, doesn't matter. So these are spherical coordinates, and if I want just a, a what I'm telling you is probably uh, is probably. Uh, trivial for you, but I would like just to, to make a very, oh, oh, excuse me, a short exercise or rather a beginning of an, no, something went wrong. Ah, something is really, Excuse me. Oh. Oh, it's now it's getting worse. No. I have to be able to calculate the new basis, yeah? So what is, for example, d over dr? I have already done this type of exercise, so I want to expand this operator uh, with respect to the old basis. So this is an element of the new basis. This is, these are elements of the old basis. Yeah. And what are expansion coefficients? If I want to differentiate with respect to R, 
then first I differentiate with respect to x and then I must differentiate x with respect to r. And I must repeat the same procedure for every for every one of those old coordinates, yeah? D u over no, no sorry, d y over d r and plus d z over d r, yeah? But r enters linearly into this formula, which simply means that if I calculate the derivative, it is nothing but x divided by r, right? Times d over dx. Yes. Plus y over r d over dy plus z over r d over dz. So just a small exercise. What will be g r r? It is nothing but the uh, scalar product of this vector d over dr with itself dr. But it is nothing but x over r d over dx plus y over r d over dy plus z over r, d over dz. And a scalar product with the same. Sorry that I am doing such trivial exercises, but this is just to show you how simple is this structure. But what are those d over dx, d over dy, d over dz? These are just the ver versors. This may be called ex. This is e nothing but the versor of the y axis, and so on. They are mutually orthogonal, and their square root with itself is equal to 1. Therefore, if I calculate the uh, scalar product of this with those, so this vanishes, so I have a scalar product which is 1 times square x square over r square. Do you see? Now, if I calculate the scalar product of this uh, component with those, then it is orthogonal. Yeah, e y is orthogonal to e x and e z. Therefore, again, there is only one term, namely that, and the same for the last part, yeah, which is z square over r square. But x square plus y square plus z square is nothing but r square, which simply means that it is 1. I'm not going to continue because it is trivial. However, you see that this way it is very simple calculation, I may calculate the scalar product KL, so it is a uh, 
three by three matrix and we have just calculated the first element, namely here, it is one. Now, this matrix is diagonal because d over dr is a vector which is <laughs> perpendicular to the earth. d over d theta is a vector which is directed towards north, uh, so, uh, south, towards south. Whereas d over d phi is a vector which is uh, which go, uh, is directed towards east, and they are uh, orthogonal. Yeah, which simply means that this is just an orthogonal matrix. So here is zero, 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 and now the. A vector which is directed towards south, it, its square of the length is r square because if uh, we are very far away from from the center, to when we move a little bit with theta. Then the length which we use is much, much longer, you see, yeah? And here it is very easy to see that it is r square uh, times sine square theta, zero, zero. It is useful to write it in the following way that it is one, and here it is r square times another matrix, namely this a, b, where gamma a, b is a two by two matrix, and it is one, zero, zero, sine square of theta. <coughs> Because, of course, if we, I, ha, I have a friend of mine who spent almost one year at South Pole. He is a geophysicist, and, and for example, uh, every afternoon he made, uh, he did an excursion on skis around the uh, South Pole. So, so it is very easy to, to move. Uh, in phi because the sign is very small. On the other hand, so if you want to move by 2 pi it, uh, near to the uh, North Pole, it, it takes you just an hour or, or so. But if you want to move on the equator where the sign is big, then it is something much more difficult. Okay, therefore, what is uh, G, which is determinant of uh, G, K, L? Ah, it is, of course, one times determinant of that. Now, determinant of that, it will be not r square, but r in the power 4, yeah, times determinant of this matrix. Yeah. I have used different a, uh, letters, a, b equal 2 and 3, which means it is just the collection of those angular coordinates where number one corresponds to the radial coordinate, yeah? Okay, um, which means that square root of g is r square times uh, square root of gamma. 
and square root of gamma is sine square, which is simply sine. So it is r square sine theta. And of course, you know this, uh, this expression, this is just a volume element in spherical coordinates, yeah? Okay. Okay, so let me finally calculate this quantity in spherical coordinates. So it is equal. One of R square and square root of gamma and now I have a, I take a summation. I take dr or d1 if you prefer, and I must sum with. But this matrix is diagonal, which means that also the inverse matrix is diagonal. Therefore, the only element which enters here is only 1, 1, or R, R. So it is inverse of 1, so is 1, yeah? So it is, again, R square, square root of gamma. G, R, R is 1, because it is an inverse metric of that and dr. Okay, so I have already calculated the radial part and now I put coordinates number 2 and 3, which means angular coordinates and now again square root of g which is nothing but r square square root of gamma now what is the inverse matrix the inverse matrix is inverse of that yeah so it is 1 over r square gamma a, B, D, B. Oh. Which is nothing but so gamma does not depend upon r because it contains only angular coordinates therefore we may put it outside so finally we obtain 1 over r square dr r square dr so the only derivatives in r in the radial coordinates are organized in this expression. Now what remains, here r square goes away, so we have 1 over r square, and what remains, oh no, sorry, of course, it's still, <laughs> it goes away only in this uh, part, but here it remains, so it is 1 over square root of gamma d a uh, square root of gamma gamma a b d b but what is that this is nothing but the same expression on a unit sphere so this object I will call two-dimensional uh, Laplace Beltrami or Laplace operator on a unit sphere, which doesn't contain any R. R is only there. Therefore, the, finally, this Laplacian is 
nothing but 1 over r square dr r square dr plus 1 over r square two-dimensional Laplacian on a unit sphere. Of course, this is a very spe special example because if we may, this formula is universal. Whatever set of coordinates you use, it is correct. But this formula probably you know because it is just a standard story in first year undergraduate calculus, but I wanted to illustrate that. And this was an exercise, and finally I passed to the I pass to the uh, uh, wave operator. So suppose let f be f of x, y, z, a function of three coordinates. And now having such a function, I will manufacture a certain function of four coordinates, which will be, ah, let it be tau, x, y, z, or maybe let me use here just uh, this terminology. This is x. And I define, so using a function which depends upon three coordinates, I define a certain function of four coordinates. Namely, I take an average value of the function which is calculated on a sphere which is centered at x and whose radius is oh. so definition I take a sphere which is centered at point X and whose radius is equal to the absolute value of tau so it is symmetric with respect to the change of tau. Yeah? So if we have this x, we take a sphere of a radius r, where r is equal to tau. And this symbol means that I integrate this function f over a sphere and divide by the uh, surface of the sphere. Just the mean value of the function. Yeah? You understand? Mean value. Me, mean value of f on the sphere s x with radius tau. Oh, very good definition. And now it turns it turns out that with these functions, I'm able to manufacture 
solutions of wave equations. And moreover, every wave equation will be of that type. I'm going to, yeah. Sorry, I, I, I just completely lost why you put a, a mean value. You said a mean value. Because I chose mean value, you will see. Because the <laughs> I chose just, just a mean value, and the theorem will be that with those uh, functions, I will be able to solve wave equations. I just take mean value. You understand what is mean value, yeah? yeah. Okay. You know, so my goal today will be to prove that such a function fulfills some partial differential equation which is very close to the wave equation and finally we'll, we are going to manufacture a solution of wave equation using these objects. But slowly, slowly we have first prove some lemma that if I take such a function, or oh, maybe I will put here any r, and th so this is a function which depends upon four parameters, upon uh, where is the center and how big is a, a sphere, yeah? And suppose I want to differentiate it over uh, space derivative number i. It is equal to, first we differentiate f over the sphere, uh, this coordinate, and then we take a mean value over, over this sphere. Instead of, <coughs> this is not a, a lecture in mathematics but in physics, so my a proof will be more heuristic than f uh, formal. Because what does it mean? This means that I take a point x, I take a, sp a sphere here, and now I want to differentiate. What does it mean? It means that I shift a little bit x, yeah, in the direction of x, y, which simply means that, that uh, uh, all this, the entire sphere is shifted. Yeah. And then I divide by the, uh, the, the, this epsilon and so on, and I go to the limit. Yeah. But at each instant of time, I take those integrals of the shifted spheres, which means that, in fact, until the integral, I take this minus that, this minus that, this minus that, and I integrate. So either I first integrate and then differentiate, or I may change the order. I may first differentiate and then integrate. So this is this theorem, very simple one. Do you see that it is true? This is just a theorem that the, of course, if the function is sufficiently uh, smooth and so on and so on. This is just a theorem about differentiation under the integration type, yeah? That, that you may, because this is an 
an integral which depends upon a parameter. So when I want to differentiate, I may first differentiate a function about this parameter and then in integ uh, integrate. Yeah? So I hope that this is obvious for you. So if we agree, then you may also, we can also do it twice. Then we may add, which simply means that if I want to uh, calculate a Laplacian of this function, It is sufficient first to calculate the Laplacian and only then to, uh, to uh, calculate the uh, mean value. Right? This is an obvious okay. I am going now to calculate So let me calculate the Laplacian at five, 5 tau x. Oh, it is nothing but the Laplacian of f. Yeah, and I, I will immediately choose this uh, conjecture. Uh, so instead of first calculating the mean value and then calculating Laplacian, I first calculate, calculate the Laplacian and then I calculate mean value. Uh, uh, yeah. But we, and now let us pass to spherical coordinates. The spherical coordinates calculated at this center x. So this, this point x corresponds to the center of spherical coordinates. So it will be, but we already, ah, we already know, but it was written here. So it is. Uh, 1 over t square d t t square ah, or maybe excuse me uh, maybe it will be more didactical where, where I first use this R. Okay, R. 1 over R square D R R square D R plus 1 over R square two-dimensional Laplacian of f and this I have to calculate as a mean value of a sphere which is centered at x which is nothing by the center and at point r. Uh, 
a lemma. This vanishes. Why? Because the, this contains uh, the, the two-dimensional Laplacian is, is a complete divergence. And you know there is a Gauss law. It tells you that whenever you calculate a divergence, it is equal to some boundary part. But what is boundary of a sphere? A sphere has no boundary. Yeah? A sphere has no boundary. Therefore, it is zero. Of course, this is just a heuristic argument, but we may calculate it. We may calculate it. Uh, I'm sorry, because of those problems with the blackboard, I have destroyed my...